I just want you to know one thing. I'm not a monster. What is the truth, and who is responsible for recounting it? When Samuel Molesky is found dead due to a fall from a height at his family's chalet in the French Alps, the lives of his partner Sandra and son Daniel are thrown into a flux. A lack of material evidence paired with an ambiguous autopsy muddy the waters as to the cause of death, calling into question whether this is a tragic accident, a suicide, or a homicide. Though it presents itself under the facade of blind justice, the French court system here puts the totality of Sandra's character on trial, questioning her as a woman, and a spouse, and a mother. Will this Grenoble courtroom reveal the truth? And even if the correct verdict is returned, can the justice system facilitate healing or protect individuals? Or is it only capable of meeting out punishment for past misdeeds? Only one truth is absolute. Snoop is a very good puppy. Oh, yes, he is. Ugh. Finally, some good cinema. Snoop for president. Oh, I know. <laughs> My God, this was... Uh, like, just seeing... I don't even know what to say. Like, I was raving about this as it came out of the theater to everybody who would listen. Um, it was actually... I was so caught up in it that I left my backpack on the box. <laughs> we see you look at that up there. I was like, I was just like, I was so just like, oh my God, I just have to tell everybody about how great this movie is that I forgot uh, my backpack on the bus. I had my computer in it. So I had to go grab that. And that was an adventure over the past couple of days. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this movie, holy shit. Um, yeah, this was actually I think it's a Cannes Film Festival winner. The I, I I know I can't pronounce this correct. The Palme d'Or. The Palme d'Or. Palme d'Or. Palme d'Or. Yeah. Um. The Palme d'Or. There we go. Um. There we go. Yes. Um. Yes, it's finally out in theaters, and oh, what a rush. Um. So I think. Uh, we both have some different things we want to talk about. So uh, I've got my little notes here. And I figure, you know, kind of start with, um, you know, the blurb that you wrote up. It kind of hits things pretty well. Um, you know, so, you know, woman, husband, and her son living in France. Suspicious death. And, yeah, things start to kind of unfold from there. <coughs> Yeah, this is very much like but, a movie that's like people talking in rooms, which is something that I very much enjoy. And I guess like you know, we kind of got like a, not a preview of it, but like a little teaser for it with like the back half of like Oppenheimer. But this is just like the uncut drug of this. Just very dense conversations um, that it finds really interesting ways to both plot out there and also just interesting ways to depict it. Absolutely. I was glued to the screen through the entire runtime. I was like, what's going to happen next? What big bombshell is going to be dropped? Um, because, and it's really interesting is that it's this, because on the surface you see like, you know, this, the trailer that they're showing is like, oh, it's this big legal thriller. But then as you watch the movie, you start to realize there's actually something else going on here. Another layer, this like, I'm like this family drama. That's unfolding um, with Daniel, actually, with uh, Sandra's son. And we'll get into that more a little bit later mm -hmm. of just how this all unfolds. But, oh my god, I loved it. Um, And honestly, it's like, wh where do we begin? Where where do we begin this whole conversation here? Yeah, I think, like, performances are so important to this because, like, you can have a really well-written screenplay script whatever but then you need someone who can absolutely uh give themselves unto everything and realize that and there's just so much pain and vulnerability in this story that you really need like strong convincing portrayals and i think that the two people that really kind of come to the fore are you know, sandra Hiller as sandra the kind of the woman who's kind of the the plaintiff in the trial um and her son daniel defendant defendant sorry i'm backwards 
Yeah, yeah, no. She's like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah she is the suspect um, in this case. And then Daniel, who's this uh, visually impaired boy um, who's now, you know, his father has died. And he doesn't know whether whether or not to believe his mother, essentially. Yeah, and I believe it's, um, again, I'm probably going to mispronounce this. I'm sorry. Um, Milo Makado Graner? Um, now, you're, you're, you're the French I, speak, I, speaker between the two of poor. us. My French is very poor. Spanish is more my forte. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Milo M- Machado Granite. That sounds um, great. <laughs> yeah. But, um, wow. Like, like, it's always so fascinating. Because, again, like I said, Sandra Hewler, she knocks it out of the park, of course, because when you're playing a role this demanding, where it's like you have so much stuff going mm-hmm. on, and you have to. Because one of the things that's interesting with the story is that, while obviously a verdict is reached, you never really find out, like, explicitly what really happened, you know? It's like, um, and so having that kind of thing there, that, um, you know, that, that's such a, hold on, I'm getting, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm tired. No, okay. <laughs> <Still. sighs> I guess it's just been a long day. I walked, like nine miles because i just walked to the bus depot on all the way on the other side of town and then back to get this thing i think that does Um, kind of get like prove a point though is like a factor you know in this trial being able to articulate yourself is incredibly important and potentially even life-altering um and sandra is put into the situation where basically her entire character is being you know kind of called into question and like she's also furthermore being asked to deliver testimony in french um she's a german woman she speaks english and is more comfortable in english than in french and that also will come to become a sticking point uh in the kind of familial dynamic but again like she one of the things she's so good at is she is you can really feel the like the stress of you know when she's trying to frame her thoughts like that um and she can feel this kind of pressure to answer these questions from someone who is fairly you know uh con- confrontational towards her and articulate in a language that she's not super comfortable with um and then even just kind of her personality is is She's, you know, a fairly strong-minded uh, person, and that kind of also comes to play in the whole kind of the, her perception by the court. At the same time, you know, there's like a vulnerability, especially mm-hmm. like you know near the end, um, where it's like where you know she gets driven to like a you know a breaking point, and you just really feel for it, and she sells that so well. Um, and then again, uh, Milo as Daniel, uh, he's only supposed to be like, what, 11? Yeah, he's quite, I think yeah, like 11 yeah. or 12. I think, yeah, 11, something yeah, like that. And again, like for this kid actor to put on a performance like this where just you can feel how uncomfortable he is about this whole thing. Because, like, you know, first of all, you know, you find your dad dead mm-hmm. and everything. Like, that's already big sh- shit you got to deal with. Yeah. And then. It becomes an investigation. You have all these weird people walking around the house and like, okay, you have to answer our questions very precisely. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you know, this testimony where if you're not careful can change the course of your entire life. And he's just a kid. So he's like, you know. Right. Yeah. There's, there's so much heaped on him just so suddenly out of the blue. And like you're saying, he has to be incredibly precise. There's no room for human error. And you can kind of understand from a court perspective, we need like the truth. This child could potentially have a reason to lie or to lie by omission or something, right? But then it's all fed into this this uh, trial that becomes a charade at points. So, you know, there's kind of hypocrisy on all sides there. And I think like, uh, the performance 
of the Daniel character is so like you know you're you're saying he's got this vulnerability to him but there's also this kind of like sense that he's very much smarter than like the court is willing for him to be like he wants to be there the whole time and he's always able to articulate why he wants to see certain things or do certain things um I don't ever want to, I don't want to manifest anything, but I was watching this and I really felt like if, God forbid, we were to ever get like a remake of The Shining, like this kid would be a very good Danny. Like it just had that same kind of like very, I don't know, adult performance of a child. And the look probably <laughs> didn't has help the name having and the floppy hair or whatever, but <laughs> it's just like, wait a minute. I, he already has the name, yeah, you know? It's halfway there. <laughs> I can just imagine. Daniel, I know <laughs> that our lives have been turned upside down by all this, but I think it's time to start anew. I've gotten a new job go to taking care of an Alps and the <laughs> oh God. It's just like the Alps. <laughs> Except... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anatomy of a fall too. Um, I, I don't know where, where where are we going with this. I think Anyways, it's, it's, suffice it to say, there are some really strong performances <laughs> at the core of this, and I think we'll be kind of picking out individual aspects of them as we kind of like start to like look at the thrust of the film. Yeah. Um. Another key aspect here is is like. I was really interested in how the cinematography was presented because there's a lot of times where the camera feels, I guess, like, I don't know how to describe it, but almost kind of like a little floaty, like, you know, like when you're watching a news program or something, like a live broadcast, you know, the camera gets kind of like jostled around a little bit, it gets adjusted, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like a little back and forth. And I thought that that was really interesting because it gave it a kind of real life feeling. Um, because other aspects like the lighting, the framing, obviously are very well done. So it's like, okay, this isn't just some random camera moves. Like this is being done deliberately. Mm -hmm. I remember one point there's even like a double take that the camera does when the judge leaves the the courtroom unexpectedly. Um, that that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Actually, that's the moment where I was like, oh, that was kind of like an interesting kind of uh, thing there. Um, and it's like, it's, cause it's not just even in the courtroom, like also like scenes in the home will have this, a uh, similar kind of camera movement to them. Yeah. I think it keeps it kind of very, not like subjective strictly as in it's like not necessarily like the point of view of a character or of like the camera is a character, but it's kind of got that sort of vocabulary where you're saying, okay, this isn't some sort of like just indifferent observer which i think you do get in a lot of like courtroom dramas which is very kind of like static um like sitting in judgment of this character or witness or whatever it's creating this vocabulary of more kind of like you know sort of fluidity in terms of what is true what is like how to perceive the information that's kind of being given to us yeah and that that point of view Creates some very interesting, um, it creates very interesting framing through the whole thing because I feel like it's about halfway through the movie. We're sitting in the middle of the trial, and I realize that it feels like the main character of the movie is really Daniel. Um, yeah, I can see that. And that wasn't something, and that was something I was expecting from the trailer because I don't know if like if Daniel like really like. Play, he doesn't play a major role in the trailer I saw and I was like oh this was such a big surprise and then there's someone else that was telling you about the movie and they're like yeah it's it's about the sun it's the blurb said so and I was like oh <laughs> <laughs> I was like it was this this really cool like almost like a twist kind of a thing that I didn't know going into the movie and they're like yeah I, it's, it's right there <laughs> I was like oh okay <laughs> Yeah, I think the camera will, um, like, keep kind of coming back to find him in the courtroom and kind of see how he's taking various pieces of information or developments. Yeah. Yeah, like, I remember being really struck by, um, because they're showing these, um, you know, the, the prosecutor and the defense are showing the different defenses, because uh, the defense 
their strategy is to say, okay, let's try to play this up as like he committed suicide because an accident will be too convenient. I won't really win people over. We have to make it look like, you know, we have to play this angle specifically um, or else you're going to go to jail. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to go to French jail. Um, and so they're presenting their exhibits and the prosecutor is like, oh, here's a simulation of <laughs> what how Sandra could strike her husband and make the blood splatter land a certain way. Here it is again. Here it is very close up. Let me give you graphic description of it. And that kind of gets capped off with uh, Daniel with, with an image of Sandra actually hitting uh, her husband. And then it cuts like to Daniel's face, and it's like, okay, like he, this just played out in his head. Mm -hmm. And then the defense comes in and is like, well, actually, this could also be accomplished by him committing suicide. So here's a little dummy we took. Here's footage of it falling, hitting the shed. We'll show it again. We'll zoom in more so you can see it again. Yeah, it's very much like. <laughs> and then. You can find an expert witness to prove anything you want. Yeah, and then. And then it cut, and then that gets kept off with an actual image of, in Daniel's head of his dad jumping from the window to his death. Mm -hmm. So it's like all these little things that just get like, it, it feels so clinical in how it's being described. And it's like, this is like a real person that was part of Daniel's life. And he's just... You know, he just he gets thrust forward into becoming an adult because of this whole ordeal, and it's not fair to him, and it's, it just makes me so sad. Yeah, it's really kind of. I think one of the key takeaways, like in this whole thing, is kind of emphasizing that, like, you know, even though the like, when no matter what the verdict is, is like, is he? You can't undo what happened. Um, and I think he realizes that and he's not fully equipped to like respond to that and move forward. And I don't think that the court for all of its, um, like, you know, at one point the judge is like, I don't really want you here because I think that this would be damaging to your psyche essentially. And he says, he kind of outlines why she can't really do anything about that. And, you know, you have your court appointed uh minder trying to keep things like untainted as far as like witness testimony and stuff goes but also kind of trying to keep interference from happening and you know again it's kind of like how can we actually like facilitate this quick side note there just a quick thing i really appreciate with this movie is that i feel like it would have been really easy for the court court appointed minder to be like Oh, you know, like, I don't trust you. I'm going to be a snooty little, you know, jerk and make your life miserable um, to kind of be like, oh, look at this poor family mm -hmm. being torn apart. And but I like that she is just kind of like she's there to do her job and she actually like tries to help out Daniel at different points, mm -hmm. like not with the trial, obviously, but just being like, hey, she's like a she's a person yeah she's a person who's trying to do her job yeah, she's like trying to facilitate and, making him feel comfortable especially towards the like kind of latter portion of the proceedings yeah and i just i really yeah that's just like a little something i wanted to point out just like, like i'm glad the movie didn't go for what would have been really low-hanging easy fruit to grab no, I think it's very uh, like even keeled in how it's portraying all of these different people with kind of their different roles in this whole situation. And then, uh, and kind of coming back to let's say you have like the point of view, seeing it very much from Daniel's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's interesting is that this the way that the story is told also facilitates this because. Generally, like in movies, the Golden Rose is like, oh, we want to put your, your information out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of like as soon as possible. But what I like is that in this movie, as things are uncovered, like very big things that you're like, oh, like, why didn't we not hear about this earlier? And it kind of mimics how Daniel, again, it's like it's not just, you know, dealing with a, a murder trial, basically, but also seeing how 
you know, his parents' relationship wasn't had a lot of stress in it. Like a lot of stuff was going on. Um and so seeing these scandalous things well, scandalous. Because <laughs> uh, some of these things are a little ridiculous that the prosecutor brings up. Um But you know, these things that when you're a family, when you are a parent and you have a kid, you have a relationship with your significant other that might be, you know, you can have complicated things going on between you, but in general, you try to keep it behind the veil so that your kid doesn't find out. You know, maybe they find out when they're an adult, but for the most part, you keep those things away from them so that they can be a kid, they can worry about kid things. Sure. And here, all of that family baggage has been ripped open. It's being put on display in a courtroom. It's being hung out for public comment. And it's being hung out there for Daniel to see in all its ugly glory. Yeah. I think that's a good way And as it. I feel it... Yeah. Um... You know, and the thing, you know, it's like things that even in a healthy relationship, you don't want your kid to find out. And I just re it, it adds again, like this really interesting theme to the movie because obviously a big theme of the movie is the spectacle of the spectacle of justice, um, and how that whole system plays out. So get to that a little bit later. Um, yeah. Just, again, it's a very movie with, with a lot of really interesting stuff going on. But I've talked for long <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, so I think that, like, with, you know, like, looking at kind of the subjective camera language, I think that kind of, like, again, all of these things are interconnected. And the most important element of all of this is probably, like, what are what are the characters in the film what are the jury and whatnot like getting out of this how is information um like revealed uh what information is revealed and when and how the events of the uh like the discovery of the fall as you noted um and our little thingy is taken from snoop's perspective the dog and this kind of will become a thread throughout the entire film where it's like the actual event is never depicted and even uh sebastian the father is never seen alive um he's like a sonic presence at the start of it when he's playing um sandra is being interviewed for a project of some sort and he's kind of playing loud music throughout the whole thing which causes them to kind of cancel the interview why is he playing that becomes kind of an important sticking point in the case but we don't see him and anytime he's depicted on screen it's either a flashback or a, a recollection or a supposition as you're saying with daniel so we the court doesn't really have a lot to go off of and all that we have is the kind of testimony of people and I think that's really interesting because, again, it's trying to... It really captures how, in these kinds of things, you have to build an image of what happened. And that image might not be fully accurate. Right. Um, and so a lot of this is trying to figure out... Um, you know, it's... it's a, oh, for, for God's sake. Oh, sucks. no. Uh, so, sorry about that. Uh, on call for more... So, I think the last thing I was talking about was, like, trying to create an image of what happened um, in the courtroom. Yeah, you're kind of like how you frame the available details. Or choose to bring up fun new ones. Oh my god. Yeah, I love, like, this public prosecutor went to the Tumblr school of argument. He was like... <laughs> Did you know that this woman wrote a character in a book that wanted to kill their husband? <laughs> yeah, she, he's like, when he starts reading from that, like, La Maison Noire or whatever that was, like, it's like, oh my god, we are, you are grasping for straws, my friend. 
Um, yeah, I, I, know. I remember. It reminded me. I think you've seen it too, but that the um, the film that came out last year, uh, Saint Omer, that's about like yes, another French yes. film about like a woman who's put on trial for basically like leaving her baby like on the beach to be like to, you know washed away or whatever. And like I remember the prosecutor in that film as well. It's just like he's not even pretending not to be just theatrical like his delivery is so fraught and over the top and we get the same thing here where it's just like you are swinging for the fences yeah <laughs> i know like and even the judge is like like this it's is like not the, a book review club yeah <laughs> like, there's just there's just so much like it comes down just as much to like the defense and the prosecution like taking bats at each other as it does like the actual like proceedings yeah it's like I, I will I will give him this like the prosec the public prosecutor has a pretty sick outfit like <laughs> the bright red it's like he was myopic <laughs> oh my god yeah it's just a very um and and that's the, and another thing that he brings up is like did you know that this woman is bisexual. <gasps> Some oh. things just are not forgivable, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> you know, but again, it's like, you know, it's this big public spectacle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's like a huge theme of the movie. Like they literally, they very explicitly say it. There is a talk show that's, you know, talking about the trying, like, you know, just, you know, a writer who kills her husband is more compelling than a teacher who committed suicide. And... You know, I feel like, you know, the real world, that's kind of comes down to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of kind of like misogyny and homophobia, like baked into kind of like the implications of the case being built by the prosecution. Yeah, you know, and, you know, and I feel like, you know, it's a spectacle that I kind of get wrapped up in as well. Like, you know, now admittedly, like, this isn't really a super great parallel. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, you know, the big Sam Bankman Freed trial just concluded, and I was watching that like it was a sports game. Um, but again, <laughs> like, at the same time, Sandra's parents were not publishing puff pieces in the New Yorker <laughs> trying right. to, you know, it's like, there's a, <laughs> a very different kind of set of circumstances. But, like, but the general idea of, like, be like, oh, you want to see. You know, it. you want it to be almost like a movie, you know, where it's like, oh, big dramatic things will happen. Um, you want to see, you know, something terrible has happened and you want to see a person brought to justice. And sometimes that happens even if the person isn't actually responsible for it. Right. Just kind of like, we need someone to pin. This thing happened, we need to come to a co collective like social decision as to what was the cause and this is kind of the mechanism by which we do that for good or for ill right you know and then as you know fact findings come out you know daniel again you know we talk about how he gets roped into this you know he's mm -hmm. interrogated you know it's like you know like oh you you're telling us a thing that you remember. You say you're sure. Let's go into your house, do this giant recreation of the scenario, go to all this trouble, and then he has this very bashful admission where he's like, "Actually, I think I did not remember correctly." And it's just like, mm -hmm. and, and like I could just feel like the secondhand embarrassment of this poor kid who's because I've done that before. Like, oh, I'm so sure of this. And then yeah no I, <laughs> but the scary thing is like that's just something we all do i forget fucking what i did this morning um but like from the from the but like from the perspective of the court or whatever now you know you could call into question okay did he just have a a little gaffe did he honestly genuinely forget or you know was he by coercion or guilt or something did he change his story to benefit his mother and you know that's something that you can now whether we don't really know but that's still something you could potentially exploit and exactly. it's all these little things coming out all these little familial imperfections coming out and then what do you do with that you have a new potential tomato to throw at somebody 
Exactly, you know, and just... <sighs> you know, and... You know, it's an ugly thing, because, like, you know, they have to... To a certain degree, they kind of have to do it to... You know, to Samuel as well, because... Mm -hmm. They have to be like, oh, this guy was so suicidal. Look how suicidal he was, you know? And Sondra's yeah. like, like, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And her hilarious song is like, this is the only way I can see this ending in your favor if we do this. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, this is the ugly step we have to take or whatnot you know i think um even just kind of the way it unspools goes into the like kind of this theatricality that you're talking about the spectacle of like there's always like this sort of i know that that's the way the court works is like there's fucking recesses every 15 minutes and whatnot but like there's always this kind of like sense of anticipation like this bombshell drops like oh there's going to be this recording we're going to talk about, but it's not going to happen until Monday. So it creates this sort of like commercial break in the in the thing and feeds into that sort of like this is sort of a heightened handling of this matter. Shocking twist. Daniel will be returning to the witness stand over the weekends. What will exactly. he say? Tune in next time. Mm -hmm. You know, and good luck sleeping tonight, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it's interesting because, like, the film both portrays that and kind of recognizes just how subjective that is. Because I think, uh, you know, that there's that recording that is um, presented, which is a fight between Sandra and Sebastian. And it's, like, the only time in the movie, aside from, that I can remember, aside from, like, the Daniel kind of, like, suppositions when, when they show the different potential ways that the accident could or the, you know that the death could have happened um it cuts back to like a flashback of the two having their kind of argument that becomes kind of ebbs and flows but the moment that like actual violence breaks out it cuts right back to the court and it's just noise like somebody is being hit there's glass breaking but again it's an audio recording you could probably push things different ways depending on how you want to handle your argument so it's you know still refusing to show its hand as to whether or not she did it yeah and again i just i really like that i like the fact that it's you know it keeps things kind of unknown for us you know in the <laughs> same way that it would be for anybody who was actually watching the trial and i like that we you know, we aren't privy to the absolute truth. Yeah. I you mean, know, hell, and, Neon, even, Neon even has that, like, did she do it.com, where if you yeah. go, it's just a poll. <laughs> I think like, when I, like, when I looked, 66% of people think she had not. Yeah. The same thing for me as I when I came. You know, what is your stance on it? What is your stance? Um. I already want to. Do you want to save it? To yeah, the we end? can. We we can save it to the end. Yeah, there you go. Now all of you at home can oh, wait God. in suspense. <laughs> Good luck sleeping tonight, Shut Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like, and again, the, um, you know, we come back to like, you know, how the stuff ends their lives. Again, they have the court appointed overseer who says like, you're not allowed to speak in your comfortable English language, but I'm here. You have to speak in French. So I can hear everything you're saying, mm -hmm. you know. And again, like she's not trying to be evil; she's just trying to no. do her job, right? And because if she fucks up, there's probably you could, you know, well, there was tampering of that, blah blah. So yeah, like yeah, everyone's like, got their yeah implications of their duties. Whoops! Mistrial. Time to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then and then at the end of it, it's like, you know. You know, Sandra, she gets acquitted. Um, and what does she win at the end of it all? Nothing. Mm hmm You know, it's like, you know, she averted going to jail, but because she won the trial, her prize is that, okay, continue as you were. Right. You know? And it's like, there's, there's no way... For her to do that though there's no way for her and daniel to do that mm -hmm. 
you know, like in the end, like, you know, he delivers count, he delivers the last word in the trial. He has like a last minute piece of testimony. Um, and we'll kind of just talk about that in a little bit here, like what exactly that was. And it's not kind of, cl it's not really clear how much his testimony actually influenced the outcome of the trial. It kind of has the gravity of it being like really, it, it, it does have this gravity of something that was really convincing because even the prosecutor doesn't really have a rebuttal for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, his mother is acquitted afterwards. She comes home and sees him again. And there's this moment where, like, she, you know, it, you know, she, like, hugs him. And he holds her head in his arms, kind of like a parent would for her kids. Um, and it's just this really sad moment, I thought, that kind of really shows that he had to be thrust into adulthood because of all this. You know, he basically came in and had to save his mom. <laughs> yeah, there's this, like, reversal of the roles in this end. Yeah, and, you know, and he can't... You know, they can't turn back the clock. He can't be a kid again after all of this. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I guess you could call it like a happy ending, so to say, because, you know, she has acquitted, they're reunited, but it still has so much sadness attached to that. It's, it's very bittersweet. Yeah. Um, thank you for reminding me of the word. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, I mean, there's like a, I don't think there's any singular, like, emotion that I was feeling, like, that, you know, it's definitely that, like, you know, you kind of get your, your, your relief of, like, a, quote-unquote, like, favorable, uh, verdict, the idea that this family are, they're not gonna, you know, Daniel isn't gonna be thrust into some sort of, like, I don't know what the like foster system would be like or whatever that would be, you know, uncertainty there, you know, but like, it's, you just kind of like, you've made a clean yes or no decision and then left a family with like, just to kind of clean up the aftermath and sort of find out what, how do you move forward from there? And that's where it's incredibly conflicted. Yeah. You know, it's like after everything, you know, they were thrust into being celebrities against their will. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's so heart-wrenching, beautiful, powerful story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely loved it. Um, do you want to talk about the puppy now? Let's talk about the puppy. Let's talk about for, Snoop. I have about eight hours to set aside for this topic. <laughs> um, let's, let's stick with the cliff notes. Let's stick with the cliff notes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll release but, yeah. my unhinged rant on a separate <laughs> channel. It's just gonna be the the Raynard, uh Snoop fan channel. It'll be a channel with one video. <laughs> um, so Snoop is family dog, and it starts because like you know in, in the beginning of the movie, um, and it, in a sense he kind of he kind of sets off a bit more of plots than you would think at the beginning because like. The reason that Daniel is out of the house when all this happens is mm -hmm. because he goes out to walk Snoop around the, the French Alps. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the initial crime scene is set up, we see it following Snoop's point of view as he's walking around. He's like, oh, what is this? What's this over here? What's going on? Mm -hmm. um, it's like one character who will never be able to offer any sort of input on the case. <laughs> Yeah, and I was I, I noticed that I noticed what was happening with that, um, and I was like, that's that's curious. I wonder why they did that. So I kind of like I put a little pin in there, and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna come back afterwards and see what's going on here. And he ultimately becomes important because near the end of the trial, Daniel like, he remembers something weird that happened. He was like, because. Part of his mother's story is that his father had tried to commit suicide in the past by swallowing aspirin, and he vomited it up. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was like, "Well, I remember like around that time, like Snoop was kind of acting weird, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of, you know, I was like, could it have been?" So he tries to feed 
the dog some aspirin to see if he can replicate the effects. Um, and then... And poor Snoop. Poor Snoop. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I, like, you know, I watched the trailer or whatever, and I remember in when I was in the theater, and it, the runtime's going on, I'm, like, remembering in the back of my head, like, there's this one shot in the trailer of, like, the dog with, like, a drip of blood from its jaw, and I'm, like, getting very stressed out. I'm, like, what the fuck is going to happen to this dog? <laughs> um, and then... Yeah. You know, we find out it's an experiment, which is kind of interesting because, like, it kind of emphasizes this. It's got this sort of like kid logic to it in a way. Like, it makes sense. Like, it's he, you, it's showing a that he's can figure out cause and effect and kind of put two and two together and then be like, how could I maybe try to prove that? But then I think if you're a little bit more kind of like I don't know mature, or like on in years, you have the moment where you're like. I'm thinking about poisoning my dog again to see what it happens. And then you like just take a step back and are like, maybe I don't do that. And he still kind of did commit, which feels a little bit more kind of like childlike in a way. So he's still clearly, you know, on this kind of threshold. Um, yeah. It's you know, like, but again, he's like, it did. It's like he saw this recreation of like some before. It's like, well, maybe like. I'll just give him like a little bit and see if mm -hmm. something somewhere. And then if he gets yeah. him too much, and he's like, "Oh my god, what have I done?" This yeah. Like... Also, like I'm sure there was plenty of like movie magic trickery going on, but there was some like very good like dog acting in that whole scene. Yeah, it's just like, how do you communicate that to a dog? Like, okay, you've yeah. been poisoned mm -hmm. by aspirin. <laughs> Just like getting it to cooperate with all that, like <laughs> yeah. I mean, Border Carlies are pretty smart, but yeah, it's like damn. Still... I know. It's just like oh, and it's like you know, and for anybody who's like, if you're listening to this without having watched the movie, like, why? <laughs> um, but this... <laughs> we revealed everything. I know. Spoilers. Oh. Uh... <laughs> But, you know, the dog is okay. I'm like, oh, thank God. Because I was like, that would have been too much. Be like, no, no, I was stressed out. <laughs> like, God no. damn it. No, Snoop is okay. Snoop lives. Snoop is champion. Um, mm -hmm. And... But this convinces Daniel to go back to testify. And the testimony, what he's talking about, is something that his father had said before um like in the past like you know after snoop had been poisoned the first time they took him to the vet and his dad is talking about like oh you know, this, you know snoop's he's a good dog um you know but he's, he's getting a little old you know he's always trying to make people happy you know he might be getting tired and one day he won't be around anymore and in this moment you know that this failed language is that he's trying to prepare daniel for the fact that he is he himself is planning to not be around as much any is not planning to not be around mm -hmm. anymore um and you know kind of link and this links him to snoop like thematically basically again like pretty explicit honestly with the dialogue there yeah well um, and then it's also important if i hope i'm not misremembering this but it's it you know the you're seeing a flashback or like a, a sequence of the past some version of it but the words while being are being spoken by daniel um like he's literally putting words into his father's mouth yeah i think i think i remember that as well i think yeah i think it's what's going on there yeah, yeah. um but yeah it's like it's a very it's just one of those cases where, like, whenever there's, like, a dog in a movie or something like that, you're always like, okay, this is just going to be, like, a part of the window dressing of the movie. And in this case, is it going to be part of the window dressing? Is it going to die? Or oh, is it going to no. something else going to happen? And, like, in this case, they there was a really important and pivotal sort of thing that kind of helps to, again, like, tie this all together. And, you know, again, everything is kind of interrelated here and makes her really fascinating narrative structure yeah and the dog plays one more big moment in the movie where at the end of everything this is literally the last shot of the movie like they're they're home 
Um, you know, Daniel's home, Sandra's home, and Sandra lays down trying to go to sleep, and Snoop kind of hops up, lies down next to her. And I thought this was really interesting because, again, I feel like at this point, you know, Snoop has kind of been linked to the memory of Samuel, to father, husband, and it's like, you know, is this kind of like coming to peace with everything? Um, yeah, I could see that, or at the very least, kind of presenting like this is the new family unit moving forward. Yeah, you know, it's, I don't know, it's like, I have to kind of think about it and be like, I have to, I have to sit down and hammer out my complete unified theory of anatomy mm -hmm. of a fall still, but <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's like, no, this is just as a general. I feel like this <laughs> is kind of a film that defies a unified theory. Is that a challenge? Is that a challenge? Uh, sure. There we go. <laughs> Throwing down the gauntlet. Um, but yeah, it's just a very, it's like one more little like emotional moment just to leave off with, with the movie and just, um, mm -hmm. my God, have we already talked about how good this was? Oh my God. I <laughs> I'm just, oh, I loved it so much. <laughs> You've been so mixed on it up to now. This is a shock <laughs> reveal. But no, I, I just... I can't stress enough just how, because again, it's exciting, it's emotional, I, and there's just there's so much going on here that I just I love to unpack. I already want to see it again. I already mm. want to see it a second time. You know, it's ah, yeah. yeah I, I think this is one of those movies like i know i don't know if it's one that like would reward you on repeat so much as like oh i didn't notice that before because i don't think that's really like necessarily the end point of it but i think it would be one that you kind of coming at it with the totality of the film you can kind of appreciate the emotional journey of the characters a little bit more with a different nuance upon return yeah like i feel like and i think you that's a good point because i don't think it's the kind of movie where it's like oh like you would see like a little hidden clue or something that you didn't notice before. Like it's not that kind of story. Mm -hmm. But I feel like going back, like seeing the the opening again, like the interview that's going on, um, the tension that's in the air there. I feel like that could be a little bit more emotionally resonant. Now that you know the whole context of all the family's dirty laundry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, do you, um, any other final thoughts about Anatomy of a Fall? Um, yeah, I was kind of scrubbing through my notes. I think the one, like, kind of little thing to just touch on briefly that I found interesting is I always like when language is, like, a facet of the storytelling, um, like, in another tool to kind of add a layer of, um interest i guess to the film and here you know we've talked we've touched on it you know kind of the family are coming from different uh like linguistic backgrounds or whatnot different levels of comfort with different things um it kind of reminded me of there was a film i saw at sif in i think like 2018 or 17 uh, 20, uh three peaks it's this like italian film about like this family who go on holiday in the Dolomites and like it's basically these like I think the husband I, they're not husband and wife I think they're just dating but the woman has like a, a eight or nine year old son who the guy is trying to kind of like ingratiate himself to like oh I'm gonna be your stepdad or I am your stepdad and it kind of becomes like it's a similar situation where like the dad's German mom's French the kid can kind of speak everything and like English in that case becomes like an uncomfortable kind of uh, middle ground for both of them. And then the kid kind of uses whether he wants to speak in which language as a way to kind of like twist the knife on various members of that dynamic and kind of it's more of a thriller or whatnot. But like I saw similar elements here where it's kind of like, you know, again, like Sandra's ability to articulate herself accurately kind of depends upon which language she's using 
it um, in colors her relationship to her husband at points because he kind of points out that she never really like made an effort to learn French as much. Um, it's just kind of an interesting like way like how does how do our choices about how we speak and what we words we use and stuff how does that you know how does that matter especially in an environment like a courtroom where the word is so so important absolutely and i feel like that does add you know a, you know a really interesting tinge to the different themes because that impacts as well her ability to communicate with her son comfortably mm -hmm. you know like even at yeah. home like you know, I can't say, like, you know, oh, son, I love you so much in the language that they prefer because the court appointed minder has to be able to hear them and understand them. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, like, that impacts their relationship there. You know, and like you said, like, it impacts her ability to argue on her behalf. And, you know, there's this point where in the middle of the court, um, like, in the trial... She says, like, you know, can I please revert back to English? So yeah. I start translating everything. And that kind of adds an anxiety of, like, well, what are they going to, you know, when you translate that, what right. kind of connotations are they going to use? And then it's just like, oh, man. Oh, yeah, my it's gosh. Like the, is the intent of my words or my sentence is going to hit some kind of incidental linguistic barrier that the translator doesn't do a good job of like bridging yeah and and again like i love uh similarly like when different languages in the film actually impact the story they have that kind of dynamic that you know because you can do all kinds of really really interesting things with that um just a wonderful little extra dimension to the whole thing mm -hmm. have i mentioned i think this movie is really good um <laughs> i'd have to scrub back through the audio but you might have oh. um yeah anything else you want to add on i think that's about it yeah it's just it's overall excellent movie um yeah, yeah i'm glad that you know we chose to talk about this because there's just it's so much to dig into here. Like, as soon as we got the theater, it's like, okay, we have to make this the next episode because yeah. uh, there's so much, so much to gush over, so much to dig into, so much to analyze and talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, really demands full attention. Absolutely. Well, hey, um, well, thank you so much for joining me tonight, uh, Raynard. Yeah, it's a pleasure as always. Yeah. And thank you all of you for listening to us. Um, We'll be back in another couple weeks with another episode. And until then, I'm Daniel Goldhorn on YouTube. 